Good day everyone. We start today's video about diarrhea with fever and dysentery. It's a continuation of our intestinal syndromes infections. And since last time we saw diarrhea without fever as the first type of patients that we'll have. Now we go into the second type of patient, which is diarrhea with fever. And you should remember that all these patients are not static. A patient might come with a diarrhea without fever and develop fever later. So we start with the overview. Diarrhea associated with fever suggests an acute inflammatory enteritis caused by a specific infectious agent. Non-inflammatory Enteritis, enteritis caused by viral or other agents may also present with fever and diarrhea, but typically it's less common. The major causes of diarrhea associated with fever are bacteria, amoebic colitis, Campylobacter, Salmonella, Shigella, and E. coli species. In some specific populations, it can be necrotizing enteritis or antibiotic-associated pseudomembranous colitis or clostridioid difficile, formerly known as clostridium difficile. Uh, we will discuss each one separately now in our video. Uh, other infectious agents causing chronic inflammatory diarrhea, they can be mycosis of GI tract, all type of mycobacterias, it can be bacterial infections, especially specific types of E. coli that can cause long term or can be syphilis. We might add here viral, some types of viral infection with the combination of bacterial opportunistic infections. But this is out, outside the scope of this specific video. We start by the epidemiology. Uh, first of all, before all of this we have to define syndrome of acute dysentery is frequent small bowel movements with mucus or pain or blood on defecation this is really important because we will have a classification of diarrheal syndrome now the first classification that we will have is winter sickness then we can have diarrhea without fever then we can have diarrhea with fever. Then if the patient has diarrhea and fever and mucus or blood in the stool, then it becomes dysentery. This in the beginning, we will explain this so that later in the video, each time we use this term, we will understand that if a patient has dysentery, it means that this patient has blood or pus inside his stool or really high pain during defecation. So characteristics of acute dysentery. It's fecal blood or pus and bowel movement as we said and inflammatory invasion of the mucosa. This is what will cause the fever which is caused by the invasion of the bacteria not only by the intoxication of the patient. The bacterial cytotoxic or parasitic destruction will cause inflammation. This invasion and inflammation will then cause toxic syndrome. It can be accompanied by fever, but most of the time it is because we will have this toxic syndrome. The range of pathologic changes during inflammatory colitis can be only superficial exudative process to deep flask shaped ulceration so these bacteria can invade all the way through our mucous membrane and will have a lot of complications when they get to this stage. Uh, if we talk about microbiology and here we have a small mistake, it shouldn't be epidemiology. This should be like definitions. If we talk about microbiology and pathogenesis of the major causes of acute dysentery syndromes, so first of all, we will start by 
syndromes caused by Shigella species and enteroinvasive E. coli, which is EIEC. Uh, acute dysentery, as we said, is characterized by invasion and inflammatory destruction of the colonic epithelium. Usually in dysentery, this will stop at the mucus level. So, we start by the Shigella species. We have four species. We have Shigella dysentery, which is the most common. We will find it most of the time. And then we have the others that are not that common, like Flexneri, Sony, and Boide. The Shigella dysentery produces a potent toxin called the Shiga toxin. Um, the Shigella dysentery and Shigella boide can both cause severe and epidemic disease. They don't come sporadic. They might be, but when they come, especially if we are having them in crowded areas, we will have more epidemic phases. If we look worldwide and not inside underdeveloped countries, we will find that Shigella flexneri and Sony are the most common species. They are facultative intracellular pathogens and they cause acute bloody, bloody dysentery by the destruction of the mucosa, which will change the permeability of the mucosal layer, which will give us exudation, high amounts of fluids, and blood inside the stool. We will have high fever and systemic manifestations because of the high amount of destruction and dehydration coming with Shigella. It is the most common cause of bloody diarrhea in children and particularly in severe malnourished children. Uh, EIEC or enteroinvasive E. coli is derived from multiple origins of E. coli, they all form into a single pathovar with the Shigella species, as some evolutionary scientists think that E. coli have got this, these genes through acquiring it from a Shigella species. Uh, they have the same mechanism where they invade, cause inflammatory destruction of the human colonic epithelium, and produce similar symptoms. The... Confirmation of their presence requires invasive demonstration or identification of associated plasmid, so usually it is just cultured, and it takes time to diagnose it. Uh, it is occasional cause of diarrhea in um, a lot of countries, but it's usually not in the developed world. Now we have an interesting type of organism, which is the STEC. Shigella toxin producing E. coli. Uh, it is also known as enterohemorrhagic because it causes dysentery, which is quite logical. Um, why does it cause hemorrhagic and called Shiga like? Because it produces a toxin that has the same structure as the Shiga toxin and it is responsible for the severe symptoms works the same way it has the same pathogenesis and the frequency is not clear as it has not been studied yet the outbreaks are usually associated with contaminated food uh, a really well studied uh, case is when we had a big review of an outbreak within specific hamburger or patties restaurant chains in the United States of America. Uh, it can be also with uncooked produce like spinach and imported sprouts. Uh, it is important to understand that one of the serotypes called the O157 is the most recognized and the most common type. But there is other serotypes. The major reservoir is cattle. And that's why when cattle, wo we use cattle manure or the water sources are contaminated with cattle feces, uh, these E. coli can stay on some of our produce that is undercooked or not cleaned well. Uh, infection is 
linked to the consumption of undercooked beef, raw milk, or as we said, products contaminated with cattle feces. Uh, contaminated water can happen, but uh, E. coli is not as stable in pure water, and especially in developed countries where water is treated. We had some waterborne outbreak reported, but usually they are in countries that have underdevelopment. The clinical presentation on development, we have an incubation period of three to four days. After ingesting the contaminated food or water, um, they start by abdominal cramps and water diarrhea. So the patient comes to us. First of all, he will be classified as diarrhea without fever. But sometimes he can directly start with a fever. Then it will be followed by bloody diarrhea. And the fever usually is minimal in the shiga-like toxin unless the patient is dehydrated. When the patient is dehydrated, the fever can go up really quick. Uh, if we take um, the O157 serotype, it, is, it has been linked really heavily with the hemolytic uremic syndrome which is a complication especially in children under five years old and older adults. The thing that makes this hemolytic uremic syndrome happen is that these bacteria can produce antigenes that promote the aggregation of thrombocytes and the aggregation of erythrocytes into small thrombotic-like structures that get destroyed in the spleen and in the kidneys uh, and they get destroyed in the spleen and then get stuck in the kidney membranes and this is why they will give us acute uh, intrarenal kidney injury thrombocytopenia and hemolysis the hemolytic uremic syndrome is really dangerous and with timely diagnosis and timely treatment uh, a lot of patients will have long-term consequences as staying on dialysis all their life. That's why it is important to remember about it, to diagnose it as early as possible. And one of the risk factors for the appearance of the hemolytic uremic syndrome is when we give antibiotics too early and the lysis of the bacteria without an immune component to stop these antibodies will increase the likelihood of the patient getting hemolytic uremic syndrome. So if we are thinking that our patient might have the EHEC, we should wait. We should not give antibiotics in the first few days. It is associated with 75% or 90% of STEC cases in North Africa. This means that 90% of hemolytic uremic syndrome patients are associated with STEC. And as we said, thrombocytopenia, low platelet count, and kidney damage are characteristic of hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uh, the virulence factors and pathogenesis. The um, STEC of 157H7 forms actin pedestals on infected mammal, mammalian cells. This is the anti-gene that we talked about. The attachment of the organism triggers assembly of actin into focused pedestals beneath the bacteria. Then it produces shiga toxin, with the shiga toxin 2 being more associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome. And other virulence factors, such as H7 flagellin, are also involved in the activation of pro-inflammatory signals. We can talk about the German outbreak, which is a well-studied case, where in 2011, a widespread outbreak of bloody diarrhea and severe hemolytic uremic syndrome occurred in Germany and extended across Europe. Uh, it was linked to interaggregative E. coli, O104 H4 stain. And during this time, a lot of people thought that it is more about the ETEC, but this was one of the interesting cases where another type of 
E. coli that also produced STX2A was positive for several EAEC whereas we see like the EAEC genes have been transferred from other types of E. coli to give us this new outbreak that's why severe hemolytic uremic syndrome appeared because it has been new antigen for our immune system Enteropathogenic E. coli or EPEC is associated with acute diarrhea in infants can rarely cause a persistent or relapsing illness certain strains especially the O groups of 1, 2, 4, 7 and 75 produce hemolysine and necrotoxin and has been found in patients with ulcer ulcerative colitis uh, this is important because a lot of patients that have ulcerative colitis will have destruction of their mucosa that mimics these pathogenesis and mimics these pathogens and a lot of doctors will just skip over this as just a clinical observation of the ulcerative colitis or a clinical presentation of this disease and they might omit that this bacteria can come through these cracks caused by the ulcerative colitis and give us bacteremia using E. coli and um, when we talk about O groups it means that this bacteria have an O antigen that has multiple types or multiple strains of this um, antigen and that's why we call them serotypes uh, the toxic strains are not present in healthy individuals or patients with acute diarrheal uh, syndromes. It is an infection that is important in various parts of the world. And the prevalence varies across countries or different regions. And usually these bacteria are found, um, I shouldn't say by mistake, but they are found by chance where a patient with diarrhea gets fecal cultures and we get this bacteria or we get it by PCR of the feces. So now we get into enteroaggregative E. coli. It is a recognized cause of persistent diarrhea, especially in India, Brazil and Mexico. It can lead to intestinal inflammation, malnutrition, even without diarrhea. It is emerging as a recognized problem because for a lot of kids and a lot of people with this chronic inflammation, it can come with minimal diarrhea or with persistent diarrhea that doesn't show infectious symptoms and the person can be malnourished and can lose a lot of weight and nutrient and it will shift the metabolism of the patient into more of a chronic stress phase. And it varies across the world and in some areas it is an emerging problem um, we don't have specific antibiotic treatment for this therapy and it not, have not been studied whether giving antibiotics to such patients can alleviate these symptoms and these clinical presentations now we get to campylobacter enteritis it includes multiple species that can cause enteric infections the most prevalent are Campylobacter jejuni which can also cause pseudoappendicitis and Campylobacter coli it is especially the jejuni is commonly isolated from enteric infections in industrialized countries and in industrialized countries it is the most common uh, cause of the area. The prevalence of Campylobacter is high in developed countries, especially among children under two years and asymptomatic carriers. Uh, the characteristics of this infection is severe abdominal pain, fever, acute inflammatory uh, enteritis, and it can range from watery diarrhea to severe dysentery with blood and pus in the stool. So Campylobacter is one of those 
uh, disease that can give us the whole specter of our clinical presentations syndromes a uh, lot of studies have linked it with reactive arthritis and Guillain-Barré syndrome with antibody antigen cross reaction which exact antibodies and which exact antigens are yet to be found uh, transmission is oral and what makes it a good um, pathogen in the industrialized world is that the infectious dose is really low so the more people you have somewhere the more the infection will keep spreading uh, outbreaks have been associated with contaminated water milk undercooked meat and poultry we have specific balance in the genes of campylobacter in adhesion colonization invasion and toxin production and that's why the host susceptibility to campylobacter remains uncertain because of the balance between all these virul virulence factors uh, all other pathogens have one specific virulence factor in these that's really stronger than all others campylobacter is this balanced character in any game that you play um, they are highly prevalent in developed countries especially among children and it can have asymptomatic carriers uh, a lot of outbreaks have been reported worldwide and the prevalence is varied across countries now we get to an important infection of ours and an emerging problem especially with emerging antibiotic resistance we are talking about clostridioid clostridioid difficile colitis or AB diarrhea antibiotic associated diarrhea this is the disease it causes and the incidence and risk factors we get to incidence and risk factors the most common cause of antibiotic associated diarrhea as we said incidence and mortality rates of CDI have increased in the past decade especially with the strains BI and PA O27 3 and this is because each one of these strains have extended spectrum of uh, antibiotic resistance uh, the biggest risk factor is advanced age and this is not only risk factor for mortality it is for recurrence and severity of the disease although now it is appearing in younger lower risk population and a lot of the times we can see it with kids that have been treated with antibiotics during childhood and this can indicate us that it is related to the disruption of normal intestinal microbiota which allows the CD colonization and growth if we take the virulence factors the primary are two large toxins toxin A and toxin B uh, these toxins inactivate RHO RAC and CDC 42 proteins leading to actin condensation and when the actin condensates you, uh, close to our cells they have skeletal changes in our cells and we will have disquamation and apoptosis and cell death therefore it will induce, inten induce intense inflammatory response with infiltration of inflammatory cells activation of submucosal neurons we will have secretion of cytokines chemokines which will increase all the toxic syndrome of this disease and if we take the cellular clinic we will have pseudomembrane in the in the colitis in the in our colitis patients and if we take the systemic then we will have really really big infection with toxic clinic clinical presentations can range from asymptomatic colonization to severe disease and death severe cases can manifest as pseudomembranous colitis 
with formation of yellow white plaques on the colonic mucosa. Um, the complication includes septic shock, leukemoid reaction, which is elevated white blood cell count. The diagnostic markers are increased level of fecal lactoferrin, which is caused by these this actin accumulation in our cells. Interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 8 have been observed in these patients but are not used for routine diagnosis. And the more we have leukocytosis, the severe, more severe the disease is. If we take the distribution, it is worldwide already, and especially in healthcare settings. The prevalence may vary across different regions and all, also the resistant patterns. That's why it is important to know the epidemiological status of CD infections in your country or inside your healthcare facility. And uh, if we take these trains that we talked about before, they have increased virulence and have been reported in different parts of the world. We go to vibriosis, where we can have classic El Tor Vibrio cholera and O130 while we have non o1 and other they can cause diarrhea wound infection and bloodstream infection but they don't uh, how to say they don't produce fever these patients don't have fever they will have inflammatory secretory diarrhea most of all it will be secretory but they can lead to in severe patients it can become inflammatory if we talk Vibrio parahemolyticus, it is associated with seafood poisoning and it includes explosive diarrhea and dysentery with blood and pus. That's why it's the non-cholera Vibrio that usually causes inflammatory disease. Cholera Vibrio doesn't uh, cause inflammatory disease. We have other species but they deserve a video on their own and we will not go into them too much here. And now we go into salmonellosis and enteric fever. Salmonella enterocolitis typically, typically presents with fever, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and it occurs 8 to 48 hours after ingestion of contaminated food. Some serovars, including enterica, especially the serovar tifamorium can cause colitis with blood and pus in the stool. Certain salmonella strains such as salmonella enterica typhi can cause enteric fever, which is a systemic illness, bacteremia with mononuclear response. They can induce really high inflammatory response mediated by cytokines such as EL2, EL1B, beta, and EL18. We will have a specific video on enteric fever and salmonellosis, which will be as long as this one. Yersiniosis. Yersiniosis is also one of the causes of our. Uh, it's one of the causes of zoonotic infections and pseudo appendicitis. It can be enterocolitica or pseudotuberculosis. These are the two species. They are enteric pathogens and they have multiple clinical presentations. Uh, usually it's hard to diagnose them because the clinical presentation is so varied that it can mimic a lot of other disease. It can cause enteric fever illness like dysentery, adenitis, inflammatory ileitis, or even ulcerative colitis syndrome. It is a associated with migratory polyarthritis, reactive arthritis, erythema nodosum, and a lot of other symptoms, especially vomiting with disseminated abscesses. If we see a patient that has diarrhea and erythema nodosum or migratory or reactive arthritis, we should always check for Yersina. Now we get to amoebiasis, which is entamoeba histolytica, as the etiological 
the origin, the etiological agent, it is a classic cause of dysenteric syndromes. Uh, the classic presentation is a camper who drank contaminated water from a stream. It can present with sustained febrile diarrhea or can cause gro grossly bloody stool since it invades the cells directly and destroys them. It should be considered in differential diagnosis for patients living in endemic areas or in travelers. And now to the diagnosis. First of all, any patient with diarrhea with fever should have clinical evaluation for the presence of blood in the stool, the presence of pain, or any signs of septis. This any of these presentations should prompt a deep evaluation of the enteric pathogens. First examination is fecal examination. We can look for leukocytes, especially if they are polymorphonuclear, or even in the absence of gross blood in the stool, we can find it in fecal examination. If we look for amoebic dysentery, we will have fewer piconetic, pycnotic leukocytes. We can do bacterial cultures. For example, shigellosis is diagnosed using culture and PCR. Usually PCR is faster, but culture is needed for confirmation. And usually we do it using stool or rectal swabs or endoscopic biopsy specimen. Uh, vibrio species uh, require specialized, specialized culture techniques and usually they are uh, diagnosed clinically, especially in areas where we have an outbreak. We can use toxin detection and this is especially for toxicogenic CDI infection where we can check for toxin A or toxin B or we can use cell culture or PCR if the toxin doesn't work because toxin, toxin detection is more of a screening test that needs confirmation. Um, the presence of the toxin will put the diagnosis but the absence of the toxin does not take away our diagnosis. Uh, some laboratories do serotyping and specialized medias. For example, EHEC is on McConkie, a medium, and some of the Kanagawa positive vibro strains use a TCBS agar. Uh, these ones are too specific and should be only done when we have appropriate clinical suspicion. Until now, the most popular method of diagnosis is PCR. Uh, it can detect almost all of the pathogens we need, uh, especially for vibrios and yersiniosis. And they are more sensitive and faster. If we took the molecular multiple assays, uh, like NAAT, it is used to detect several enteropathogens but they have higher accuracy and higher specificity but they are not always available that's why it's always important for us to check with our laboratory to know which tests are available to know which ones to use microscopic examination or antigen testing can be used to diagnose amoebic dysentery by direct examination or by proctoscop uh, of fresh fecal or proctoscopic specimen. Uh, we can find cysts or trophozoites. Uh, fecal or serum antigen tests can also distinguish between normal types of intamoeba histolytica and non-virulent types. Um, biopsy is used especially sigmoidoscopy, sigmoidoscopic biopsies to diagnose pseudomembranous colitis or the identification of specific parasites. 
uh, some radiologic examinations are used to and um, biopsies that are usually used to differentiate between infectious diarrhea, infectious bloody diarrhea, and autoimmune like uh, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. We can use a lot of biomarkers, especially biomarkers of acute prolonged inflammation, such as fecal myeloperoxidase or neopetrine, and may be associated with gross neopterine, I'm sorry, and may be associated with gross shortfalls in young children. But as all our diagnostic tests, we should check with our lab to know if these tests can be made in our hospitals. Now to the treatment. The first staple of our treatment is fluid management. It is the primary treatment for all acute diarrheal disease syndromes. Uh, we should start with oral rehydration therapy. And it is recommended to use the WHO ORS formula. We will have a specific video on fluid resuscitation and fluid treatment in GI patients, where we will go in depth into which types of electrolytes solution, which types of solution, the amount of solution, how to calculate them for different populations. Uh, if we talk about antimicrobial therapy for inflammatory colitis, the cho choice of antimicrobial therapy varies depending on the specific organism or the resistant pattern within the area we live in. Uh, for example, if we have acute febrile dysentery and we are waiting for confirmation of our diagnosis using PCR or cultures, we can start empirically by fluoroquinolones. Uh, it can be justified, especially in hospitalized children with severe dysentery with fever, especially in clinical cases where we have comorbidities. Other than that, it's better to wait for our culture results or our PCRs. Uh, if we talk about specific pathogens where we already found the pathogen, which antibiotics is better? For example, in Shigella, a short course of ciprofloxacin may be effective, but we should also consider local resistant patterns. Uh, EHEC or EIEC, we don't have any effective therapy for them. Compilobacter, the same. Uh, some patients will have faster recovery if they get erythromycin or ciprofloxacin or azithromycin but we have started to notice resistance and it is still a matter of debate CDI infection it is usually treated with fidaximicin and vancomycin and sometimes we can add metronidazole uh, alternative approaches in patients who are having relapses, who are having recurrences or severe uh, disease course, we can add probiotics or fecal microbiota transplantation or monoclonal antibodies. Um, CDI infections with their treatment are becoming more and more hard to treat and they require prompt organization of the treatment course. Um, there is specific schemes and guidelines for how for the treatment of these patients and they also will have the video on their own. If we take uh, Vibrio parahemolyticus, uh, as with other types of Vibrio, tetracycline or doxycycline may reduce the duration and the severity of the symptom. Uh, in Salmonella, we don't give therapy unless it gets to enteric fever or in severely ill patients. Those patients 
have risk of extra intestinal spread. That's why we are we treat them with uh, fluoroquinolones or cephalosporins of the third generation. These antibiotics will not help with our intestinal symptoms, but will help prevent or decrease the severity of extra intestinal spread of bacteria. Uh, Yersinia doesn't need any bacteria and antibacterial treatment, but to prevent the systemic inflammation, uh, systemic spread, or severe illness, we can use tetracycline, ciprofloxacin, or chloramphenicol. Now for the prevention. Uh, prevention starts with personal hygiene. It is by washing hands with soap, water, especially before handling food or after using the bathroom or after changing diapers or working in the garden. We should teach children proper hand washing and uses, uh, hand washing and techniques to children uh, to make it as a hardwired habit for them. And we can use hand sanitizers when soap and water are not available. If we talk about food safety, proper food handling, storage, and preparation techniques prevent contamination of our food. For example, if we have cut, just cut chicken or beef on a cutting board, we shouldn't use the same knife before cleaning it or the same board to cut our salad after it. Or if we are storing our eggs somewhere, we shouldn't store it with the food that we will eat raw after that. And the same goes with for chicken, for example. Or the same goes for vegetables that we bought in the farmer's market that can be contaminated with cattle feces. And we put them in our fridge without cleaning them. We should cook food thoroughly, especially meat, poultry, and eggs. We should avoid consuming raw or undercooked foods, especially seafood and eggs. We should wash fruits and vegetables before consuming, as we said, because they can be contaminated by cattle feces, which is used for soil enrichment. And we should maintain proper hygiene while handling and serving our food. Now, if we talk about water safety, we should consume clean and safe drinking water from reliable sources. And usually in each country, we will have a list of re reliable sources of water. If tap water is unsafe, then we should drink bottled water or use a water purification method such as boiling or using filters. We should avoid swallowing water while swimming in potentially contaminated water. And if we talk about environmental hygiene, we should maintain and clean sanitary living condition. Use proper disposal of human animal waste to prevent contamination of our water sources. And we should promote these practices in public areas to make it as a habit or a part of our culture. Now, if we talk about infectious control, in healthcare settings, it is important to apply infectious control methods whenever we have patients with CDI infections in our facility. We should check for resistant patterns and culture patterns. And we should isolate these patients to minimize transmission to other people. Now, if we talk about vaccination, it plays a crucial role in preventing enteric infections especially that vaccines are available but they are available for limited numbers of pathogens. Uh, we can talk first about vaccines of typhoid fever which is recommended for people traveling into these endemic areas and it includes two types which are the live attenuated or the polysaccharide vaccine. Uh, we will discuss it in detail in the next video. If we talk about cholera, we have a live attenuated oral vaccine 
for cholera and we give it for travelers into these areas or healthcare workers who work in facilities dealing with these patients. And we still have research and development of vaccines and it is needed to combat the various enteric pathogens causing diarrhea worldwide as it is until now one of the leading causes of death for children in undeveloped countries. Now, if we will talk about specific infections with clinical syndromes, we can start by necrotizing enterocolitis in newborns. Uh, by definition, it is a syndrome characterized by diffuse fulminating necrotizing colitis in newborn infant, which can lead to intestinal perforation, peritonitis, bacteremia, and death. It is a major cause of mortality in kids with low birth. Uh, low birth weight. Uh, one of the proposed theories is that kids born underweight cannot sustain normal immunity microbiota bi uh, balance since in all of our guts we have a balance between immune tolerance of the microbiota and immune defense against them. And when this balance is disrupted we will have all sorts of disease. Uh, it is suggested that this is one of the mechanisms of the development of necrotizing enterocolitis. It is defined by the presence of air in the intestinal wall in cases of really fast fulminant necrotization and we will have the splitting of the layers of our intestinal wall. Um, we will have air in the portal venous symptom, uh, system because of the high permeability of the gut. We will have mucosal slouching, slouching and necrosis of the bowel wall. This necrosis can lead into air inside the peritoneal cavity and the necrosis can be so deep that it gets into perforation and air inside the peritoneal cavity. The terminal ileum is commonly affected, but it can also be in any part of the GI tract. It is believed to involve mucosal injury primarily of ischemic origin due to hypoxim, hypoxicemic, hypoxemic, I'm sorry, or hypotensive episodes. This is one of the other theories where the kid or the newborn cannot sustain normal blood supply into his own bowel or gut and that's why it starts hypoxema and the microbiota will start attacking uh, other including factors which is endotoxemia effects of epinephrine asphyxia with healing membrane disease or cyanotic heart disease or increased intraluminal pressures we have the absence of lysosome in human breast milk may allow the overgrowth of gram-negative bacteria, the lysozym. Uh, when the newborn is too young to get breast milk, this can be one of the risk factors. And some studies suggest localized reaction to endotoxicemia and gram-negative bacteria. The clinical features are um, Spells of apnoea, vomiting, abdominal distension, and occasional bloody diarrhea. It is most common in infants younger than one week, and especially those who are premature and have had maternal infection during delivery or umbilical vein exchange transfusion, for example. Radiographs will show signs of perforation, air, in peritoneal cavity, in the wall of the intestine, or even in the venous system. The diagnosis. It should be suspected in every newborn with bloody uh, stool, abdominal distension, and apnoic spells. Any one of those three clinical syndromes 
should direct our attention toward anisi. Uh, stool examination should start directly for occult blood and we should start early and aggressive management with removal of umbilical catheters, cessation of oral feeding and initiation of nasogastric aspiration to decrease the pressure on the walls and on the gut and try to increase the perfusion of blood into this area. Uh, we should have intense intravenous therapy and surgical intervention. Laparotomy is the last uh, ditch therapy used to treat the complications. How to prevent it? We prevent it by avoiding risk factors and implementation care for infectious control in newborn intensive care units. Breastfeeding is associated with lower risk of NEC as it provides protection through lysozyme antibodies and cellular elements. Um, prophylactic use of non-absorbable antibiotics and the role of epidermal growth factor and probiotics are still not studied well enough. So, we also have Enteritis necroticans, or the pigbell disease. It is a severe necrotizing jejunitis that has been observed in epidemics and in sporadic cases. It was described in post-war Germany and then recognized in Papua New Guinea, and it was particularly associated with pork feasting. It involves acute patchy necrotizing disease of the small bowel which can progress rapidly into segmental gangrene. Pathogenesis is with toxic production of Clostridium perfringes type C including alpha and beta toxins and poor nutrition, low levels of digestive proteases and trypsin inhibitors and in the diet will increase the levels of Clostridium perfringens and the toxins able to contribute to the pathogenesis. The clinical features especially include anorexia, vomiting, severe abdominal pain, bloody diarrhea, and fulminant toxicemia. It can progress rapidly, it can lead to septic shot and death if not diagnosed and treated timely. Uh, complications include peritonitis, abscess formation, and sepsis. Diagnosis is clinical with a history of poor consumption and laboratory findings. It may show leukocytes, elevated liver enzymes, and metabolic acidosis. Uh, imaging will show sign of bowel necrosis and gas in the bowel wall. Intervention, especially surgical intervention, is crucial to remove necrotic bowel segments and prevent further complications. And antibiotic therapy targeting Clostridium perfringens should be initiated directly. Uh, it is prevented by normal food handling, cooking practices, adequate nutrition, and it can be against vaccination against Clostridium perfringens, especially if it's a high-risk area. And now into chronic inflammatory infection of the GI tract. Uh, we can start by chronic infectious enteritis, which is indolent, slowly progressive infections that cause the chronic inflammation. The symptoms include fever, abdominal pain, weight loss, and systemic manifestations. They are usually caused by Clostridium, Salmonella, and Shigella, and sometimes it is uh, considered to be a recurrence of the same disease rather than a chronic continuation of the disease itself. If they last beyond two weeks, they are considered severe and pose a high risk of nutritional deficit in the patient and especially in kids and tropical areas. 
uh, one of the causes of chronic diarrhea is syphilis, which can involve the GI tract, especially affecting the upper part. In late secondary syphilis, we can have erosive gastritis, which involves the motile spirochets themselves invading the gastric mucosa and giving symptoms that resemble all inflammatory invasive diarrheas. And late manifestations of syphilis can include uh, obstruction, especially pyloric, uh, constrictions, and formations of guma inside the stomach wall and the GI tract wall with all its complications. If we talk about GI tuberculosis, which is a manifestation of extra tuberculous, extra pulmonary tuberculosis, it is emerging, especially in HIV patients. And it is a strain of mycobacterium tuberculosis that is multi-drug resistant. And this poses a really big problem for us to diagnose and treat. It is really hard to diagnose tuberculosis and even harder if it's in the stool. Primary intestinal TB can result in hypertrophic changes while secondary stems from a pulmonary source, which is like dissemination from the pulmonary primary infection site. Patients may have abdominal pain, fever, and a palpable mass in the ileocecal area. Uh, fever and abdominal pain, which will be relieved by defecation or vomiting. We will have weight loss, and they are all common symptoms. It occurs into one third of patients that have Uh, GI di uh, TB GI diarrhea diagnosis is challenging and requires differentiation from other conditions like Crohn's disease sarcoidosis actonomycosis that's why it's sometimes easier to exclude all other pathogens than to diagnose this one uh, we can have radiological findings that show irritability hypermotility of erythritica region and scarring, especially with calcified nodules, which can be one of the symptoms that can give us the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis. Uh, culturing M um, are necessary for definitive diagnosis, but as we said, it is really hard to do. Complications may include perforation, peritonitis, and obstruction, as in any other uh, invasive inflammatory diarrhea. This was today's video. As you can see, this is the map that we used. Thank you for watching. And the map can be found on our Patreon page in PDF format. And you can pause at any point in this video to come back to it. I hope this video was important for you was helpful and as always we do these videos not by any specific protocols but using Mandel book of infectious disease which is one of the best sources for understanding the infection understanding how to deal with it and having the best knowledge to be able to help our patients we are not here to try to pass some exam or get better with notes we are here to treat our patients better Thank you again for watching. See you next time.